David Yetman in the Sonoran Desert with my colleague, my esteemed colleague and celebrity chef, Janos Wilder. And we are still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, but because we're distancing appropriately, Janos, let's take off our masks. Okay. Then I can hear you better. Yes, and I can see you better. This lecture series is sponsored by the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and the Learning Curve Adult Education. All the proceeds from this program go to the Border Restoration Project, which works on the border and with people in Mexico, indigenous people affected by the virus. It's a great cause. Today's program features Emma Perez, my colleague and friend, who is not only a celebrated novelist, but an authority on much of Mexican culture. And she brings an unusual twist to things, and you're doing some food in accordance with her wishes. Yes, I am, and happily so. It's not often I get a call to work with Wheat La Coche. <laughs> and, and, and Emma and I were, 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 cor were corresponding, and I said, Well, what would you like me to cook for this? I, there's a, you know, La Malinche is a tr tremendous icon, and She's going to talk all about her, and she said, you know what? Would you make Wheat La Coche tacos? So that's what I'm going to do. Well, before you do that, well, I guess I can wait, but you need to tell us about Wheat La Coche. Okay, well, that's where we'll start. So this Wheat La Coche is corn that's engorged with a fungus. In the Midwest of the United States, they call it Mexican corn smut. They don't want to have anything to do with it. To, to, to them, it's a blight. The word smut itself just sounds so it's something you'd never want to get close to. Yes, I think that's purposeful. <laughs> but their loss is everybody else's gain. Who knows what a, what, what, what a wonderful delicacy it is. So, the, and I'm sorry, I, I was unable to get any fresh, but if I were, were you'd see a cob of corn that's sort of gray with a fungus and the yellow of the corn kernels, but it engorges the corn kernel, so a little corn kernel becomes bigger than your thumb. And this, they, they, so in the Midwest, they call it corn smut. Elsewhere, they call them corn truffles. They're beautiful flavor. They're, they're a mild flavor. They're distinct and wonderful. And they, they've got certainly a tremendous amount of corn flavor, but it takes a lovely turn as well. And so you'll see this all over Mexico. And rarely do we get it north of the border. And I actually, I, there are occasions where farmers brought, brought this to me because we, we don't know what to do with this. And oh, I can help you, you out. You can there. help. I can, <laughs> I can help them out. So that becomes the cornerstone for this dish. This is this is this is the real deal here. So uh, what in the U.S. Is, is generally viewed as a crop destroying disease is viewed in Mexico as a blessing of the gods because it's such a delicacy. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. So that's what we see it as today. And you, you're going to get a chance to taste this later on. And, and you've had it before. You know how wonderful. Is. We're going to start. I'm going to start by just doing a, a, a salsa. So I've already started the salsa. We've got fresh tomatoes in there and garlic and scallions. I'm going to add some poblanos, roasted poblanos. You add more than one kind of chili. Yeah, I add two. I like poblano chilies, which have a, 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 a sort of a deeper flavor, and these are Anaheim's, which can be a little hot this time of the year. These are not particularly hot, and. I'm gonna put some onion in here. So here's a red, uh, excuse me, a white onion. So when you dice an onion, Dave, undoubtedly you know this, so I'm not teaching you anything, I'm sure. But so peel the onion. You've got two sides, you've got the stem side, and you've cut off the tip. So we're gonna put flat side down. Then we're gonna cut in half through what would be the stem or the, the root. And we're going to put it in, cut it, and, and put it flat side down again. I don't want it rolling all over on me. Then I'm going to make these little slices towards but not through the stem. And I'm going to crossways. All right, and now I'm going to cut down. Look at that perfect dice. 
Why didn't I know this before? You didn't know this. Really? I did not know. Okay, all right. This is I've worth the price something. of admission right now. I'm going to make right. a special donation. Okay. But I've been chopping you. onions wrong my whole life. Well, you got a lot of years left here, David. You can, you can start right now, and you've got it right. So, all right, so now we have onions. We're going to put a little cilantro in here. Onions, chilies, garlic, tomatoes, scallions. I've got two types of vinegar here. This is a red wine vinegar. A little more of a bite. And this is a balsamic vinegar, an aged Both vinegar vinegars. from Italy. This would be not a traditional, nor, nor ordinarily yeah. in Mexico, it's going to be citrus acid. You're going to put lime juice in yeah. there. I like this salsa. I, I, I like the, what, it, what it does to it. And I'm a little sort of unconventional. And this is sort of an unconventional dish. So we're going to just set this aside. All right? Now, turn on. I'm sorry, I've got to, I, I do have to work right here. And I'm gonna. So these are magnetic induction. These are induction burners. So this big mm -hmm. magnet underneath this, underneath this, very heavy, and you get all the atoms moving around, and that's what creates heat. They transfer the heat to action. This is will never get hot. It takes on heat from the pan, but if itself it wouldn't get hot. They, they heat the pan. And this is a really quick way to, 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 to heat. And we can do that here without having a big hood over top of us. Now, are our most um, advanced chefs using the induction? No. I mean, this is when you can't, for reasons, um, oh, in, 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 on ocean liners, they don't want to have a lot of open glass gas yeah. flames. Um, Places like this, in, in this application, where, where I don't want to have the sound of a hood, or build a yeah, hood over right. here, so this works. But no, first choice is always, in my mind, gas. That's, yeah, that's, okay. that, that's the best. Okay, so, we, but look how fast. Look at, look at that oil's nice and hot. So we're going to add a little red onion. You know, my humble philosophy has always been. Olive oil and onions, you can't go wrong with. <laughs> we got to start with something good, yeah. huh? I'm just going to sweat these onions for a little tiny bit here. This is really simple. We're not, this is a taco, right? So we're not going to put tons of different things in here. It's going to be some onions, some garlic, um, some chilies. I'm going to add some chilies to it. The wheat la coche. I'm going to put these in beautiful like, Fresh, warm mm. corn tortillas with a little case of little salsa and a little case of fresco over the top. You're torturing me. For a little while. You'll be released from the torture. I see. With the, when, the, when, the, when the tacos that come along in a minute or two. So I'm not going to, I don't want to caramelize these, but I want to cook some of the rawness out of them. But I also don't want them to cut, become super soft because I want the texture. Now I'm going to put garlic in. I don't put the garlic in at the beginning because I don't want to scorch the garlic. And that's real finely chopped. Yeah, yeah, just so you you mash it first and you blunt it. You know, the side of the knife, you just smash down on it because what you want to re do to re is release the oils. That's where mm -hmm. the flavor is. And then we chop it up really fine. It's also really good for you. Oh, and doesn't it smell good too? Okay, here we go. This is the and Anaheim this is more chili. Of the, that's the Anaheim, it's okay. That's the Anaheim. And, and there goes the wheat la coche. Here goes the wheat la coche. Yeah, I'm really torturing you, aren't I? You can see the no, little, I mean, if you look, yeah. you can see this. There's, here's like just some little corn right there. This, that had been an unengorged ear of corn. I want a little salt. Look, crack that pepper. One thing I like about what you're doing is you're not 
trying to overwhelm the wheat liquor. No, this it is the main voice. It has its own delicate flavor. It is, and that's the main voice. I just want to accent it a little bit. We get a couple of tacos out, here, tortillas out here. So these are hand stretched, handmade corn, fresh corn tortillas. And where are they from? I get these at Lenoria here in uh -huh. Tucson on Prince Road. They bring them up from Mexico almost daily. I think my stove's backing up. Did you hear that? The I beep see. beep is it's gotta walk, watch out, it's gonna back up into me. <laughs> All right. It's got a backup light on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh, does that smell good? Oh my. And then this fresh salsa, which will not disguise the flavor, but accent it. A little crumbled up queso fresco. And I know as soon as we're off air, these are finished. These are done. They're going to be consumed in a heartbeat. Yes, they are. And that is the idea. Have no fear. All right. So, Emma, it's all yours. Here we've got your Huitla Coche tacos. Emma, you have a tough act to follow. Malinche would agree. We're gonna get started now. We're gonna get started now. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Emma Perez um, at the Southwest Center at University of Arizona, and I am here with um, Alicia Caspar de Alba, close friend. We've been friends for what 23 years, probably over a little. Yeah, about 23 years, come the decades. Alicia Caspar de Alba is professor at the. Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana Chicano Studies and Central American Studies. And she is actually one of the founding members of mm -hmm. the um, of the center there. 26 years at that place, right? Mm -hmm. You've made quite a mark because she's chaired the department 2007 to 2010, chaired LGBTQ studies 2013 to 2019. Uh, what's remarkable about Alicia is that she's published 12 books, three novels, two collections, th th of the 12 books, three are novels, two are collections of short fiction, two are collections of poetry. There are what? Two single authored academic books, mm -hmm. three anthologies. Mm -hmm. um, and she is from El Paso Juarez, right? You're from El Paso mm -hmm. Juarez, grew up native of the region, which is another way that I, I think we also had something in common because I was at UTEP for what, 12 years myself. Yeah. But I think that um, the other thing I wanted to point out is the importance of, of you as a Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz scholar mm -hmm. and that you've published a novel mm -hmm. about Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz and an opera has well, been recently yeah. adapted, adapted mm -hmm. from the novel, mm -hmm. which I've had the the, the uh, privilege of seeing, and I think the opera, once COVID is over, is going, probably going to be touring again, isn't it? I think so. It's going to yeah. be touring, or it's going to be uh, televised, or somehow filmed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the It was supposed to have come out in New York, mm -hmm. uh, played in New York in this August. Because I was going to go. And so, mm -hmm. for next August, I think what they're going to do is they're going to try to film it, the performance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that at least they can have the performance, yeah. but you know, then it'll be yeah. available. Yeah, that's remarkable. It's a beautiful opera, by the way, for those yeah. of you watching, if and, you have an opportunity. And it was it was written the opera by Carla Lucero. Yes. She's the composer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Juanina de la Cruz, you're also, and I think not just a, a scholar of that. I think I have discovered just how much you have written about La Maninche, Maninche in Tenepal, which. Who is the topic of the of the lecture today? And this is part of a lecture right. series with the Southwest Center, which is also part of a food series. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But what I want to do with you today is basically we'll be we'll have a conversation because I'm an historian, 
you know, I'm an historian. I've been an historian for what? A long time. All your life? <laughs> All my life, since 1988. But a creative writer as well, as you mm -hmm. well know. Um, and I um, am a little bit of a theoretician, I think I like to say. Yeah, just a, just a, little, a bit, little bit. A little bit of a theoretician, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, so as Chicanas, Chicanex, mm -hmm. right? as Chicanex, we, there comes a time in our academic career that Malin Centenepal, Doña Marina, La Malinche, crosses our path. Mm -hmm. And I, most of the Chicanas, Chicanex that I have talked to, as well as Mexicanas, become profoundly affected mm -hmm. with this woman, with this cultural icon, with this metaphor, with this real person. Why is that? Why do you think that is? What is it about Malinche that? that draws us so much as Chicanas, Chicanex, in your opinion. And then you're even in your own work. I mean, why do you write about her? Why did you begin to write about her? Because you've written poetry about her. You've written essays about her. What you've done recently, too, is you didn't you write cure, something for a museum about my... Oh, yeah, I wrote an essay. There's, wrote a an new, essay. there's a new exhibition opening, yeah. I believe, next year, mm -hmm. 2021 or 2022, at the, you know, at the Museum of De uh, uh, Denver. Um, and it is a Malinche exhibition, which basically shows Malinche in like five of the many different interpretations mm -hmm. that are given to Malinche, mm -hmm. uh, historical and contemporary. And so what they're doing with the catalog is that they're asking you to sort of comment how you use Malinche in your own work mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then putting you in a particular section mm -hmm. uh, that pairs up with some of the artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, of that section. has been done on Malinche. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there it is again. I mean, Malinche is so prominent in our culture, oh, yeah. in our communities, nationally, mm -hmm. internationally. What is it about Malinche? Okay. Well, you know, I think Malinche is like Sor Juana as a as mm -hmm. and the Virgen de Guadalupe as like these three icons mm -hmm. of, of Me Mexicano culture, you know, and the three female icons, most powerful icons, all uh, you know, in some way, look at us in the future and give us a role model for. Uh, a kind of activism mm -hmm. that they were doing back then all by themselves mm -hmm. and that and that we you know continue mm -hmm. in our day mm -hmm. but but at first as you know Malinche is used um, uh, um, colloquially as an expression of uh, negativity yes. if you're a Malinchista yes that means that you are not Mexican yes. or not Mexican enough yes. or somehow you are uh, turning your back on Mexico and yeah. trying to pretend like you're not Mexican. And you're betraying your race. That's because you're betraying your yeah. country. Not your you're race, betraying you're, your you're betraying your country. You're betraying Mexico, which yes. is what she's considered to have done. She betrayed the Mexica. Yes. She betrayed the Aztecas right. to side with the Españoles, hence the reason for the conquest. Right, right because she is the Mexican Eve. Yeah. The Mexican she Eve. is held to be the one who caused the downfall of the whole Mexica Aztec Empire. Mm -hmm. This one little young woman. 14 year old. Yeah, who had so much power in, in her in her lips because she could make you know syllables of different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, that gave her the power, you know, mm -hmm. to to across time, mm -hmm. five hundred years worth, yeah. to be seen as this betrayer. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so colloquially you are a Malinche and you're a betrayer. Yeah. And you can be used that, that way, in, mm -hmm. I mean, it, called Malinche, uh, as a betrayer in so many different formats. I think what's interesting, too, is that people, people know the concept. They know the word. They know Malinchista. All they really know about her is this woman was Cortez's concubine. Cortez's lover. Whore, yeah. Lover. Uh -huh. She was someone who sided with Cortez. Mm -hmm. Hence the and translated for him, hence mm -hmm. the downfall of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. That's mostly what most people know. Mm -hmm. But they don't know what Norma Larcon, Chicana feminist, mm -hmm. right, says, how do we put let's put flesh back on this mm -hmm. on this cultural icon? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when we think about her historically as an historical figure? Mm -hmm. So once that happens, but let's talk about her then. Who was she really? Mm -hmm. What is some of the what what can we say about who she really was? Well, I, get, I can tell you this. This is how important she is to me. I say that when I found out the real history of Malinche, mm -hmm. 
uh, I, she gave me my Chicana identity. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I learned about her in the one and only Chicano literature course I ever mm -hmm. took mm -hmm. in college at UT El Paso, mm -hmm. which was Teresa Melendez Hayes Chicano literature class. Mm -hmm. And, and we were reading about Malinche, mm -hmm. and we were reading Adelaida del Castillo's, because I Which think is, she wrote the very she first. She did, 1974. Yeah. Um, a preliminary look at Malinche. A preliminary look. And, mm -hmm. and, and Malinche in Tenepal. Malinche in Tenepal. Mm -hmm. And that was the essay that I read when I was an undergrad at UCLA, mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to know Adelaida because she was a she was an anthropology grad student. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from her. She was mm -hmm. brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Still is. Still yeah, is. she yeah. still is. Still is. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, well, what she told me was that she had taken a year off from school, wow. from college, to work on the essay research. Yeah. and do the research for the essay. So, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. If I had yeah. students who could write like that nowadays, I'd be like over the and moon. And to be that. So that that dedicated that condition, you know yeah, that to kind one of thing. Condition. but also it was a time period right i mean adelaida the younger generation i mean those of us who were coming into the doing our chicana studies you're one of them too um we have so many friends who are we were like kind of that second generation after all the after all the chicano mm -hmm. scholars right we yeah. the chicanas who came along and the chicanets who came along and started doing research started that hadn't been done on the Started revising on the, the women, story. Started revising the women from a feminist perspective and started doing the queer stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Query that the way mm -hmm. Gloria Sandua mm -hmm. was doing as well. But I think what's interesting to me here too is the way Adelaida gives us the background, the historical background. Yes. Who was she really? Exactly. What happens with her? Right. We know her mother. Her mother father. sold her into slavery. And she was an Aztec princess. She, was a, she, she was literally a, was an Aztec princess. Yes. You know, people talk about that. Right. Yeah. She was an Aztec princess, but her mother, uh, I guess the father died and the mother remarried. Yes. And even though it's a patriarchal culture, uh, I guess I guess uh, inheritance of title was passed down matrilineal which is through very, the female. Which is very common for a lot of tribal groups, right? Indigenous groups. Even the if they're patriarchal. Even if they're patriarchal, mm -hmm. many of them are matrilineal too, mm -hmm. and they'll pass down. Daughters are very important mm -hmm. to pass down property. So then, and so then mom yeah. marries, you know, a second guy and, and gives birth to a boy. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the the father wants the boy to inherit the title. Mm -hmm. And so she gets sold, Malinche gets mm -hmm. sold into slavery uh, as a young, very young girl. Mm -hmm. And she sold, I think, to some Maya merchants that yes. are passing by. Yes. Uh, that are, yeah. yeah, and then and then she get she is raised among the Maya. Yeah. And that's how she learns the Maya language, mm -hmm. right? Now I'm not sure if if it's um if the Maya language is called Maya or Chontal or is Chontal a sim a, a form of the Maya language? I don't. know, It's one of those complicated mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. questions. But anyway, so she knows Nahuatl mm -hmm. and she knows the Maya language. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when she uh, comes into the the story with, I mean, she comes into the story with of the conquest right away. Yeah. Because uh, right, is it Cortez uh, mm -hmm. arriving down there in Veracruz. Uh, yeah, no, in, yeah, in Veracruz, in Veracruz, in Veracruz yeah. Yeah. and uh, and is is uh, demolishing, mm -hmm. you know, with with his armored men mm -hmm. and. The kinds of weapons that they had, mm -hmm. uh, these these people who are like in awe, mm -hmm. thinking this is some kind of god coming to them, and of mm -hmm. course they're not going to approach the god with hostility, and yet the god is you know massacring killing them, them. Yeah, yeah, massacring them, mm -hmm. and uh, and then he gets greeted right by the cacique mm -hmm. of one of the uh, tribes, and, mm -hmm. and the cacique gives him all kinds of gifts, mm -hmm. thinking, okay, we have to render tribute because he's a great warrior, mm -hmm. he's killed all these people, mm -hmm. so we're going to give him gold and lots of food, mm -hmm. and, and women. And women. Yeah, because women were the virgins. Women yeah, were women given as virgins. gifts. Yeah. And among the harem that was given uh, was Malich. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the 24, weren't there 24 versions? 20 or 24, Something the like number that, changes. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, one thing that I read said that he gave, he was given 100 women, so I don't know wow. what the number was. But anyway, um, I've always heard that it was 20 or, mm -hmm. or 24. Yeah. So then uh, he turns around, he, you know, Malinche is just a young girl, young mm -hmm. Indian girl. He gives her to one of his captains mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, figures very quickly that they, these people, these native people are going to think that I'm this incredible 
uh, figure that they're mm -hmm. going to render tribute to. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he kind of uses that, but he's not really quite understanding, even though he brings with him Jeronimo de Aguilar. Yes, yes, Jeronimo it's very Aguilar. important because yes. he, knows, he knows Maya. He right? knows Maya. Mm -hmm. So and because he's he's among this is this mm -hmm. is still Maya speaking country. Yes, uh, he's able to translate for mm -hmm. him, you know, for him mm -hmm. uh, with the Maya folk, and then he learns that these people are not happy living under the rule of the Aztecs mm -hmm. of the Mexicas, mm -hmm. that they're you know bloodthirsty and colonizers, uh, colonizers, and, yes. and, and and always poaching on the people mm -hmm. who offer to their gods and stuff. And so uh, they decide that, well, since he's such a mighty warrior, they mm -hmm. should team up with him mm -hmm. to try to take over, yeah. uh, you know, control away from the from the Mexicas. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, he renders mm -hmm. himself uh, even more powerful yeah. with the help of all of these disgruntled tribes that, that latch onto him. Yeah. So then um, once he gets to uh, Nahuatl speaking country, though, Jeronimo de Aguilar ya vale madre, as they say, because, useless because now yeah. he doesn't know Nahuatl, mm -hmm. and out comes this young girl who happens to know Nahuatl and, and Maya. Maya. Exactly. And so now she's able to translate from the Mexica folk to, mm -hmm. you know, him, and then he can translate to mm -hmm. Cortes. Yeah. 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 And so immediately, his uh, her estimation in his eyes completely changes, mm -hmm. and he has her baptized. Yeah, and and baptized Doña and baptized Doña Marina. Marina. Doña Marina. And so then, yeah. uh, the the captain that he yeah. had given her to something I was reading says that he sent him off back to Spain and mm -hmm. and you know took the girl onto himself, mm -hmm. and so then of course he became she became his property. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And and very soon because of her translation skill, right? Yeah. She was la lengua. She was la lengua. Yeah, and that's exactly. how the native people saw her. Yeah, la lengua. And they and they admired her because yeah. they still thought of them as these gods, mm -hmm. and uh, and because she could speak to mm -hmm. the the higher ups, mm -hmm. right? The Latuanis. Mm -hmm. You know, right? The 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 the, pe the person in power was yeah. a Latuani. He who yeah. speaks. Yeah. And only he who speaks can speak to the gods. And she mm -hmm. was speaking to the gods and, and to the Tlatuani. In yeah. a way, she was kind of like a Tlatuani herself. Well, she was the one. What's so interesting to me is if you look at some of the pictographs of Cortes mm -hmm. with, uh, what was his name? The, the, um, who was the king at the time? You mean Moctezuma? Moctezuma. Mm -hmm. You see her in the middle. She's oh, always in the middle. She's, she's the interlocutor. Mm -hmm. She's the one who is bringing, mm -hmm. you know, translating. But also there's an incredible amount of power in being in that Nepantla space. She's and the that bridge. Interested, she's the bridge. Mm -hmm. She's definitely the bridge between mm -hmm. los españoles and the Aztecas and the new, and the new world, mm -hmm. right? What's going to become the new world. And not only so, she's the middle person, she's also the biggest person in the she's picture. She's the biggest person in the picture, usually. Mm -hmm. And that's how she's depicted. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've also heard this, maybe you've heard it too, that 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 when they would see, the Indios, Indias would see them coming along, they would call him El Malinche. Uh -huh. Cortez wasn't known as Cortez, he was El Malinche. Yes. Because he was in related, relation to her. To her. Yeah. Which I think is always very interesting. It's yeah, they changed the they changed mm -hmm. the order yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So she was more prominent mm -hmm. in their minds. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So she and here she was what fourteen, fifteen. And and the reason that they the called they probably called I mean they called her Malin Tsin. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Malinali, mm -hmm. but then Tsin is uh, is a uh, yeah. uh, added to people who ha have a certain level yeah. distinction. Yeah. So Malintzin, yeah. right? And so then that in Spanish became Malintzin, became Malinche. Malinche. And yeah. so that's where Malinche comes. The syncretic. It becomes the syncretic, right? right. Between the Spanish and the and the, the Nahuatl. Right. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So so that's, I mean, that's really the story. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that the, the, the very first things, myths that uh, Adelaida's essay debunked mm -hmm. uh, was this nation of betraying her country. Exactly. Betraying her people. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, mm -hmm. she says there was no such thing as a country. There was no patria to betray. Mm -hmm. This was a collection of different tribes, most of whom were not happy about being with colonized the yeah. by the Mexica to begin with. Mm -hmm. Everybody kept their language, kept their culture, kept their everything. They just mm -hmm. had to render taxes and tribute to, 
the Aztecs, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, they were loosely affiliated, yeah. but there was no patria for her to betray. A. B. Mm -hmm. She had already been sold into slavery. By her own parents. By her, by own, her own mother. mother. By her own, so, who holds a mock funeral? Oh, that's right. That's she right. holds she a mock funeral, funeral saying, saying oh, her daughter's dead. And so everyone believes, oh, okay, the daughter's dead. So that's gone. right. So now the son can inherit. That's right. Legally inherit. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so again, how is she going to owe any loyalty to the very people that Sold her betrayed her to her begin mother. with? You know? Yeah. So she's really the betrayed daughter. Yes. Right? Um, and then, and then, of course, because she, she is seen as the willing uh, sexual, you know, uh, concubine, concubine of 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 Cortez, mm -hmm. they see her as uh, a puta, right? yes. the, the the whore of Cortez, mm -hmm. who uh, you know, because she falls in love with him, uh, renders all the secrets that she learns from the yeah. Mexica and the Aztec, she, she tells him everything of what they're going to do. So she retrains no from that way. There is no record that she falls in love with him. There's no record, not. of course not. And besides, at that point, she's a sexual slave. Yeah, Remember, absolutely. she was given in a harem. Absolutely. So and she's a sexual slave. That. So if whoever wants to take her, you know, can take her. And so if he says, this is my woman, yeah. or this is my whatever, then he gets to do it whenever yeah. he wants. Yeah. And so therefore, she didn't have a choice in whether she, she wanted to be or not mm -hmm. to be somebody's lover. But isn't that interesting, though? Because when we think of that culturally, what does that mean for present day Chicanas, Mexicanas? When they think, when we go back to the cultural myth and the manner yeah. in which she is realistically being treated. She's a sexual slave. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get to have that kind of agency. She mm -hmm. finds her agency. Oh, yeah. We cannot see her just as this passive kid. No, oh, no. Not. She finds agency and uses her language. Well, because she sees right yes. away how important it is yeah. to be able to speak between yeah. the two parties. And that's why she learned Spanish like in six weeks or something. Mm -hmm. So she le learned Spanish right away. So that there's no need for Jeronimo de Aguilar anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so he smart. kind of falls out of the picture. Yeah. And so now she is the direct translator. Yeah. Uh, right. So she's yeah. the direct, uh, the, the, the direct link between yeah. the two, the two people. Yeah. The two sides of the, you know, of the coin of mm -hmm. our identity, basically. Um, and so that's why they say she had all the power mm -hmm. and she, she had, you know, she was able to, to mm -hmm. learn all of the tactical secrets uh, that mm -hmm. the, the Mexicas were going to use against the Spaniards. And she, mm -hmm. was, she conveyed them to uh, Cortes. And mm -hmm. so that's why he was able to then counteract mm -hmm. and have the kind of success that he that had. He had. Yeah. So then suddenly she is the, like they mm -hmm. said, the great Eve, yeah. you know, yeah. of, of the Mexica Empire. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But then if we think of her in contemporary times... She gets reinscribed, really, because generationally, different decades, I think we both know this because mm -hmm. you're in American studies, but mm -hmm. you've also studied history mm -hmm. in depth. I mean, a lot. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of your background. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the closeted historian. You're very much a closeted historian, <laughs> although I think you've been out it. But anyway, I'm, like, yeah. just like I'm a closeted, what, creative writer. Yeah. Maybe. And you're definitely out it. I'm definitely out it. Definitely out it. Yeah. But, um. What's interesting to me is that is the way each so many each century, so many centuries perceives her in different ways, right? And we've talked about that. Like right. the Spanish conquest, the Spanish chronicler, Bernal Diaz, how does he see her? She's the she's the amazing, wonderful person, woman who helped them conquer mm -hmm. Mexico. Then we go to the Mexican independence period. Well, she betrayed her country, mm -hmm. right? That's how she's perceived. But then we go to the Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. Her indigeneity, mm -hmm. she's the mother of a new race, Yeah, right? she's the mother of mestizaje. All of a sudden, she's the mother of mestizaje. Right. And we have Los Tres Grandes, Cineros, right. Diego Rivera, mm -hmm. Orozco, mm -hmm. all depicting her indigeneity. Mm -hmm. And so the Mexican Revolution uplifts her once mm -hmm. again. But then that gets squashed. Mm -hmm. by none other than Mr. Labyrinth of Solitude, Octavio Paz. My favorite. Who I think had so much to do with so many Chicana, Mexicana feminists grabbing on to what he had, the way he himself, the, the, the very thing he says about her is that she was basically raped, right? She yes. is the... More than that, she was, I have to say yeah. the word, he calls her la chingada. La chingada, hija de la And then he goes into yeah. an entire, yeah. like, uh, like a breakdown mm -hmm. uh, of, of the word chingada. 
Yeah. Right. And and he basically says she is la chingada. Yeah. Okay. And and when Mexicanos say hijo de la chingada, because they're always saying hijo de la chingada or la mm-hmm. chingada or la chingada. It's malinche. It's malinche. Yeah. It's to say hija yes. of the fucked one. Of the fucked woman who yes. was also raped, who was demeaned, who was negated, who all of these. Who opened her legs, he says. Opened her legs. opened her legs to the conquer as if yeah. she had any choice. Yeah. Uh, who opened her legs to the conquer and basically let in, yes, right, let in the conquer, and that becomes the metaphor for opening the country, opening the land, mm-hmm. uh, and and welcoming in the conquer and mm-hmm. giving him all of mm-hmm. yourself and him taking it and taking all of Absolutely. your identity and your future and your posterity. Talk about colonial desire. The, the, the matrix of coloniality and its desire, but that's something else. But, but he calls her abject. Yes, he calls her abject. Yeah, he I calls her know. abject. And yeah. he says, what does he say? That thing about about how she is the, um, she's in the incarnation of, uh, you know, basically sin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So not Absolutely. only does, does that does does he now effectively transform Malija into like this vile mm-hmm. sinner? He's actually imposing this very misogynistic Absolutely. interpretation. Yeah. And those of us who were thinking of her uh, mm-hmm. as the mother of Mestizaje and all that beautiful, mm-hmm. you know, that romantic. That since the revolution. Yeah, since now the revolution. it's like, oh, you know, yeah. that's right. yeah. she's a chingada. She's not the mother of Mestizaje. Exactly. The yeah. raped woman. She allowed herself to be raped. Mm-hmm. Allowed, allowed herself to be raped and to be seduced. And willingly and helped. And willingly helped. This, helped him yeah. bring down but, the empire. And that's post-1950s. And is it interesting? Because then that's what becomes so uniform in many ways. It's not until Chicana make it kind of feminists come along yep and they turn that on its head and that's Adelaide del Castillo but it was also interesting enough to me interestingly enough Octavio Paz's ex-wife Elena Garro wrote mm-hmm. blame it on the uh, Tlaxcaltecas la culpa es de los Tlaxcaltecas where she has this Malinche figure who is herself has all kinds of agency right mm-hmm and you can tell that there was a real battle between Garro and Baz. I mean, mm-hmm. she divorced him and went to, what? The, she had that, put a continent between them. She went to France <laughs> before. And then he got, right? Yeah. After that, he died, I think. No, he, he died in 98. He died in 98. I had a chance to meet him once. He's very soft hands, this man. I, heard a, I had a chance of hearing him. And he, yeah, he mm-hmm. doesn't have a very, he's also a very soft voice. Mm-hmm. But, but, but listen to his words, because I want to yeah. read this one, this little yeah. quote from the, his book. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is Los Hijos de la Malinche in uh, Labyrinth, of, Labyrinth Solitude, of Solitude which was published in the 50s yeah, yeah. Uh, she said, he says her passivity mm-hmm. La Malinche's passivity is abject she does not resist violence mm-hmm. but is an inert heap of bones, blood and dust an inert heap Wow. her taint is constitutional and resides in her sex this passivity open to the outside world mm-hmm. causes her to lose her identity. She is the chingada. She is nothing with yeah. a capital N, nothing. Oh, <laughs> the, the, the severity of misogyny is just, it's just unconscionable. It is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. And, and that's but why then, we, we all take on Octavio yes, Paz. We have, I mean, I write, I write about it. Adelada writes about it. You write about it. Ana Castillo's written about it. Dina has, Gonzalez has written about it. Who else has written about it? I mean, and then we have all the artists, too. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Artists, which, by the way, I need to mention right away, because I failed to do that. We're at Casa Nepatla in Los Angeles. The brilliant, talented, amazing artist... Alma Lopez, Gaspar de Alba, is our videographer right now, Alma. And we see some of her amazing artwork back here. And the house actually is filled with, with um, Alma's art pieces. So I, I felt I needed to say that. So, um, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, but really you're absolutely on. right. I mean, yeah. that, speaking of the art, um, his, he sees her as full passivity. Yeah. And yet if you go back to the lienzos, 
if you go back to the codices, mm -hmm. the fact that she's depicted in the middle I know. as the I know. tallest person, yes. as the powerful it's all there. connector, it's all there. the, the bridge, documents, the evidence. There's no passivity there. I know. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no passivity. So where does this man get off on calling her so passive and so abject and all that bullshit? He was he was projecting. Oh my God, he's disgusting. I mean, I'm sorry. I know that a lot of people venerate him as if he were the second coming or something. Nobel Prize winner, besides that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobel Prize winner. Oh, oh yeah. my God. But, um, yeah, so I think I think that, unfortunately, big Octavio says the same things about Chicanos and Chicano. Oh, right? Don't, let's let's don't, don't even let's let me go about, there. Because, uh, you know, before yeah. we get into the let's, Pachuco. Let's talk more about money. Let's and stay, that's the, let's stick to money you know, chilling. I'll have to take an antacid or something. But, <clears> um, so, yes, feminists re have reinscribed that. Yes. Post 1960s is really when we saw the emergence of so many Chicanx, Mexicana writers saying, this is bullshit, and no, let's show. Let's show how indeed she had them. She had agency, this young girl, but let's also look at the fact that she was a 14 year old girl. That's right. For Christ's sakes, who mm -hmm. probably died in her 20s. That's right. As far as we know, we're mm -hmm. not really sure. We think she died in her 20s. We know she had a son with Cortez named Martin. We know she had a couple of children with Jaramillo, the soldier that he married, Cortez marries her off to. When his wife shows up. When his wife shows up. But From we Spain. Don't, we don't know if she died in Honduras. We don't know if she was roaming the countryside, a la Llorona kind of type, because she's also seen as a kind of Llorona for the time period, right? Who lost her children. So Do you think La Malincha knew how to cook? Well, that's a very good question. She was 14. Would she have known how to cook? I don't know. My mom was cooking at the age of eight in the convent, out at the... Um, and they were picking cotton, right? So girls had to know. Uh, are, you at home, for, are you also asking because you don't think I know how to cook? Is that what this is? I know you know how to cook. <laughs> and I know I know how to cook. I know you know how to cook. Uh, but, okay. But <laughs> the, the home that she shared with Jaramillo. Butches know how to cook. Okay. Butches use, butches use cooking to, you know. Okay. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> you, we use cooking but did to clean our hands. Know how to cook. Did Malinche know how to cook? But the reason I'm asking, okay, is the mm -hmm. home she shared with, with uh, Juan Jaramillo, mm -hmm. uh, Juan, I think was his name, mm -hmm. um, has been, according to the legend printed on the menu, uh, was transformed into a restaurant called wow. Malinche. Where is it in Mexico? It's, in, it's in, down in the Ciudad. downtown area. I wonder it's if in the downtown there. area. And when I saw that there was a Malinche restaurant, obviously, yeah. you, you know, I had to go there. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, it, it looks like it could have been one of those colonial homes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the big tall ceilings yeah. and all the big huge windows. Yeah. Yeah. Así muy elegante, right? Sí. Um, and so, you know, you get seated at this beautiful table with okay. a nice white tablecloth and all I would, that. I would remember. And, and the I waiters, así todos mm -hmm. muy formales, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so all they serve there is traditional Mexican recipes. Yeah. Okay. So they have like mole and they mm -hmm. have, um, you know, uh, tacos de huichlacoche and yeah. all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, but they also have and what I ordered because my grandmother used to make this and I wanted to compare it to my grandmother because she was like really the, the best cook I mm -hmm. ever knew, mm -hmm. uh, was the chiles en nogada. Oh my God. Yes. Chiles en nogada. Chiles en nogada. No right. Chiles so then nogada. they, so they have these two ginormous, uh, you know, chiles this size. Yeah. You know, stuff with that beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, uh, picadillo. Sí, sí. Uh, and then each of them is covered with the, the seeds, right? Mm -hmm. The pomegranate, pomegranate seeds. seeds yeah. And they're sitting on a bed of that delicious cold, mm -hmm. um, uh, walnut sauce. Oh my God. Okay. So and, and so, so you take a, you know, you slice into that chile and mm -hmm. you get that sweet picadillo with the tartness mm -hmm. of the pomegranate with that richness of the walnut seed. Mm -hmm. And you take it all into your mouth and it's like this explosion of flavor. You're just like, oh my God. So they were good then. Kind of good. <laughs> Cause I had really Kinda good chiles. If but, we're talking about chiles in Nogal, I had really good ones in um, San Miguel de Allende. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they have really ones. good one. So these are, this is a recipe. This, this is food from the time this period. This is food, food from the, but, but the thing is, that's interesting about, about mm -hmm. chiles and ojada mm -hmm. is that they're really a dish about the Mexican nation. Yeah. 
because of the three yes, colors. The three colors, absolutely. Right? The green, the yeah. red of the pomegranate, and the yeah. white of the of the walnut sauce. Yeah. Right? So yeah. here's this nationalistic dish mm -hmm. being presented at the Malinche restaurant as a you know traditional recipe uh, that mm -hmm. that would have been served during her time period. Well, obviously they're collapsing a few centuries. They are collapsing into yeah. right. So that who knows this, which la potche would have made more sense. Yes, you know? yes, yeah. exactly. With the corn, with corn, with yeah. the corn fungus and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. But yeah. uh, but anyway, so when you first told me about this interview and that it had something to do with food, I, yeah. I thought, oh, I have the perfect story to tell about, <laughs> about the Jeez. Maliche restaurant yeah. um, and that that may or may not still be there. Yeah. But it was a very fine restaurant. So I'm just wondering if she knew how to cook as well as everything but else. What's she knew. interesting is the, in, the imposition of that. I mean, yeah, a few centuries later. I mean, but this is so much about how we as historians, as scholars, how we impose the present upon the past. Right? Oh, always. And that, I mean, yes, I'm going to mention Foucault. For him, it's that genealogy. We always take the manner in which we socially construct our ideas and we impose them on the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, young people think they do, that they're the ones who've discovered that, but really we've always been doing this. Yeah. Um, and, and then what does that mean when that happens? I mean, then there are different interpretations. Each generation has its own interpretation. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for someone? I mean, we're in a post, supposedly post-feminist period. So what does that mean for Malinche, right? And how is she being perceived now by a younger generation? Well, I think that, you know, I, I know that in my classes at UCLA, mm -hmm. every time I teach on Malinche and bring up yeah. all these things, yeah. the the first generation students who have either are immigrant or they're mm -hmm. the first generation after their parents uh, who would only have heard about her in the context of mm -hmm. malinchismo and mm -hmm. betrayal and all yeah. that they're at first you know they're kind of like not letting go of yeah. oh no no oh no she it's she was a betrayer. betrayer she was Malinche's a bad woman it she was this she was that absolutely and then thank you Octavio Paz. and yeah. then they start gradually you know getting it they start gradually seeing Mm -hmm. The injustice that was perpetrated against her, mm -hmm. you know, by history. Yeah, by history, absolutely, absolutely. And Although it's really, we have, it's really in connecting her with La Llorona that they get yeah. that point. Yeah, and that's why when you were saying she was that woman who was mm -hmm. wandering around because Martin Cortez was supposedly taken by by Cortez, and and then Jaramillo mm -hmm. took their children, and so she's wandering around looking yeah. for her children. That 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 when it's when she becomes conflated with La Llorona, uh, the grieving mother. Yes. That suddenly now she brings out the out, out the empathy. Absolutely, and it and it you know because when I teach it too, I talk a lot about the virgin whore complex. Right here we have yeah. who is Malinche. Mm -hmm. She's always on the side of the whore, mm -hmm. and we have Virgen de Guadalupe over here, and mm -hmm. La Llorona is somewhere in the middle, but mm -hmm. then not really because she's the grieving mother. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Once she becomes the grieving mother, then yes, okay. We can accept her. Mm -hmm. But so long as she's sexualized, mm -hmm. and that's still culturally what that's we right. discover. Latinas who are sexualized, Chicanas, Mexicanas, who are right. sexualized. Precise, and by Hollywood and by literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been there have been books written by Anglo author, authors, white authors, where they treat her as if she's a nymphomaniac. Mm -hmm. She's that's how she's characterized. Mm -hmm. Not just Cortez's whore, but that she's a nymphomaniac mm -hmm. at the age of 14, 15, yeah. 16. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just and it's that just she has wild. no no agency whatsoever, and she just happens to be this this consequence mm -hmm. of, the, of the conquest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you when you think about the brilliance in that person mm -hmm. who who uh, was able to speak at least three languages yeah. and one of them is the conquering language that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with any of the linguistic mm -hmm. you know roots of mm -hmm. her own languages right mm -hmm. um, the brilliance of that and and the brilliance of of what she may and or may not have said mm -hmm. you know because I figure they're projecting on her the idea that she betrayed the Aztecs by conveying the, her, their secrets to the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that. They don't know what she said or what she didn't say. Mm -hmm. We could easily project a whole other kind of dialogue onto Absolutely. her. Absolutely. Because Adelaida talks about how she was used to catechize them. Mm -hmm. uh, she was used to promote the, the, the you know, 
the, the happy tidings of Christianity. And that it was all under the guise of she accepted Cortes as the as the new Quetzalcoatl, as mm -hmm. Quetzalcoatl who had returned. Mm -hmm. Because it all happens in the year one read, right? Which mm -hmm. is 1519. Mm -hmm. And so that was the mistake. That was the year that, that yeah. Quetzalcoatl was prophesied to return. To return. Uh, coming in from the blind east. man with a beard and... And it's coming in from the east, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, the big thing, yeah. this floating chariot comes in from yeah. the east, and these men in this armor and these mm -hmm. beasts, and that's why they're gods, and all these things, mm -hmm. right? So um, so she is then this um, person who may have said to them, let's, let's pretend, because... <laughs> They're killing us, exactly. and they mean they mean it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And and they're because they're making us believe in their gods as well. Absolutely, because people forget. I mean, those who are being colonized, those who are being oppressed, those who are being victimized, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. They're not stupid, you know. So, and I think what we we find that over and over again in history, and people assume, oh, we have here we have the victors, here we have the losers. The victors are so damn smart. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no. What we have are people over here who are negotiating so much and who are figuring out how do we manipulate these col these mm -hmm. damn colonizers, these, mm -hmm. white, these white dude colonizers. Yeah, right? yeah. And really, how can we save ourselves? Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to quote, I'm, I'm going to go back to Alma ourselves. a little yeah. bit because I was telling you about the, um, she and I edited a book called Our Lady of Controversy uh, based on that horrible controversy that came up in mm -hmm. 2001 as a result of one of her art pieces uh, uh, that that uh, was being um, basically people mm -hmm. wanted it to be censored from the exhibition that was in at the in Museum of oh uh, yeah mm -hmm. the Santa Fe Museum of, of uh, International mm -hmm. Folk Art I mm -hmm. think it was mm -hmm. and so that all kinds of people and people arriving mm -hmm. from like Philadelphia and all kinds of people were like you know outside the museum you know chanting mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. you know take her down and mm -hmm. uh, hang her. And they were talking about the, the artist and the, cur the, yeah. the curator of the exhibition, yeah. uh, specifically that they were responsible for promoting this very degenerate view of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. So it generated this horrible, and mm -hmm. in many ways she was seen as a Malinche figure. Absolutely. She, she was seen as a Malinche figure. Betraying Catholicism. She's betraying Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Betraying and, the culture, which and, is the culture. And right? in fact, it didn't help that people said she herself is Mexican. She herself grew up with this figure because then she's like, well, yeah, that's what that's why she is a betrayer because this is the, her own culture mm -hmm. and look what she's doing. Yeah. So anyway, so we put a book together eleven years after, ten years after that whole business, and um, in one of her essays where she spent a lot of time researching the actual, you know, bit by bit of, mm -hmm. of the costume, of not the costume, but you know, the robes of, of the mm -hmm. Virgin and what all of these symbols meant. And the fact that these symbols are actually, you know, Mexica symbols, mm -hmm. you know, that yeah. represent like the different tribes yeah. and that represent like, mm -hmm. like, oh, speaking symbols, like listen mm -hmm. to the, everybody listen to this message. Yeah. And, and in, in fact, so the Virgen of Guadalupe is constructed as a message mm -hmm. that they're saying, we're going to continue to die yeah. unless yes, we absolutely. do this big turnaround absolutely. and we act like we're venerating this figure. Absolutely. You know, we are venerating this figure because she is the, you know, blah, 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 the virgin of whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they think it's a Catholic virgin, but in reality, it's our own mother, mm -hmm. Donancy. Yeah. So Tonantzin is it lives under these robes. Yeah. So we can still continue yeah. to worship our goddess, in no matter what yeah. she's wearing. But Absolutely. what we're gonna give her to wear, and that's what makes her so different from the Virgin Mary. When people call her the Virgin Mary, I always say she's not the Virgin she's Mary. She's not the Virgin Mary. Okay. Absolutely this is not. a different Virgin. Yeah. Look at what she's wearing. Virgin Mary never wore this kind of stuff. Mm -mm. Right? Mm -hmm. She's always worn just a plain, the plain blue Absolutely. or white or blue whatever. Or white. That's it. Nothing on it. Nothing yeah. on it. Yeah. Those are messages. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those messages are written in their language mm -hmm. and nobody but they could understand them. But mm -hmm. interestingly enough, within a year, mm -hmm. they've converted. They've converted to, to Christianity and uh, suddenly they're not dying by the, mm -hmm. you know, bucket full and yeah. and you know whatever and also interestingly she too dies 
according to some of the stuff that I've read, she dies within a, a decade after the conquest. Malincha does. Malincha yeah. does. Yeah. Ten she years did. later, yeah, she's she dead dies ten years of later. smallpox. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the one, one of the things that's yeah. never remembered. All these people who are blaming her for the downfall, right? They don't blame the fact that the Europeans brought right. all these the diseases disease, yeah. that they had no immunity to. Mm -hmm. And of course they were going to die. Mm -hmm. Right, let alone being whipped to death and worked to death and mm -hmm. uh, punished and just outright, you know, killed. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it's like that mm -hmm. in connection with all those tribes that were mm -hmm. angry already at the mm -hmm. Mexicas mm -hmm. who helped out the Spaniards, mm -hmm. uh, who also took place, you know, in took a huge role in defeating the, the, mm -hmm. the Mexica. You know, why are you going to blame this one girl? Mm -hmm. I mean, how unfair is that? It just gets back to the, to I mean, the virgin whore complex, right? Yeah. We totally can accept, is. and and the way in which people go after Alma Lopez and her, and the way she's depicting the Virgen, because mm -hmm. the Virgen has to be, well, has to be pure, cannot be sexualized in any way. Cannot be sexualized in cannot any way. Cannot be sexualized. And over here, then you've got your whore. You have Malincha. She's the sexualized one. She's the one who's been raped. She's the one who is a whore and will be used in that way. And over here is our beef head. Don't, don't. Conflate them. Don't conflate mm -hmm. them. Uh, women do not get to have a sex life. Women do not get to have their own agency with sex. And that has so much to do with contemporary misogyny and anti-feminism mm -hmm. not just in that's our right. culture it that's crosses right. culture oh yeah it's all it patriarchal crosses, oh, you know patriarchal culture and who gets to have agency right and the thing is that just really quickly going back to that image of, of our lady mm -hmm. uh, that alma did she's not attempting to sexualize her no that's, she's not that's the interpretation uh, that the men give her precisely. and that the priests give her and that all these good catholics give her because she so is depicting her right as a powerful woman wearing roses yeah. and you can see her abs and you can see her thighs and she's standing there looking like yeah okay exactly. that's me powerful and that becomes sexualized exactly that becomes translated into a woman's body just because she's showing her abs and her legs is already because is already interpreted yeah. as a whore Absolutely. or as the archbishop called her a street walker yeah and a tart and what is wrong with street walk sex workers yeah people exactly i mean again it's like let's treat sex walk workers like they're not human not when in fact human. Mm -hmm. who is who is profiting who's privileged who gets off the hook over and over and over again who when sex is workers more are to blame although both be guilty of wrongdoing she who sins for pay or he who pays to sin <laughs> or is this for Sor Juana, of course. of course, of course, in hombres necios, of course, in hombres necios. Uh -huh. you know, we've been going for some time, but yes. I want to, and I really want to thank you. We can you. continue all we night. Can, I don't know. We can do this for hours. It's always so fun that when you and I get together and and argue and debate and contribute to each other. Um, yeah, but what I want to do is end with. You reading a poem on Malinche. Oh, my, my Malinche poem? Your Malinche poem, oh, okay. please. And okay. let's, let's close in that way. But I want to thank you oh, for this Oh, thank amazing. you. And this has also, been so much fun. Also for the whole thing about Malinche restaurant. I don't think I've ever been there. I hope it's still there. So that next Cafe time we're... Cuba. Cafe Tacuba, I have it too. Yeah, of course. Which shows up in Elena Garro's story on the Tlaxcaltecas. Oh, really? Oh, she, wow. So much happens in Cafe Tacuba because... That's a region during the conquest, right? Yes, of course. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. So this this was one of the poems I wrote for my master's thesis okay. at UT El Paso in 1982 or 1983. Wow, 1982. That's when I met Dina Gonzalez. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. I think and I had no idea. That she existed in the world, yes. or you existed in the yes, world. I in fact, existed. I had no idea Gloria Saldo existed, or Shuri Moraga existed, even though they had already published uh, this bridge called My Back. Yeah. We were not reading her or them mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. this Chicano literature class, unfortunately. I, I didn't I didn't read them until I was like starting with my PhD. Well, I was living in LA, going to UCLA, where you teach now. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Shuri and Gloria and another group of women were 
soliciting, asking for essays and articles and poems. For this bridge? That, for this bridge, yeah. yeah. I remember. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen that. But so no. it wasn't in our classrooms, no. It wasn't no. in our classrooms. No, and so none of, this interpre- none of my early interpretations had anything to do with their interpretations because I didn't know, you know what they were writing about. Mm-hmm. And then later to find that uh, here Cherie writing about a long line of Vendidas mm-hmm. in 1982 or 83 when her book mm-hmm. comes out. Mm-hmm. And and so much of that is already in my own work. Yeah. So like independently, we're all seeing People, yeah, her absolutely. the same way. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, the Chicana feminist. Mm-hmm. Chicana X. Mexicanas too were seen her in the same way. So this so, poem yeah. came out, it was a result of, a, of an assignment in a poetry class that was revised a myth. In, in, in our culture and so everybody in the room was writing about the cinderella the sleeping beauty the, hmm. you know all those myths and there you are in la frontera and and we're on la frontera <laughs> you know are writing about cinderella you know well, there's a way because, describing them too. because it's the english department at utep yeah. and it was mostly white folk i think i was the only chicana in yeah. the room even though <laughs> we're in el paso okay so uh, Malinchista, a myth revised, was my retelling of this Malinche myth, and I connect her to La Llorona at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's my retelling of that myth uh, after having read Adelaide del Castillo mm-hmm. and after having read some of the other essays mm-hmm. that I was reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also uh, Lucha Corti's uh, oh, poetry, Lucha her Marina Corpus. poems. Yes, her I mean, Marina those were amazing. Poems. I mean, we just read those. Poet. Yeah. yeah. So it begins with an epigraph. It is a traditional Mexican belief that La Malinche, Aztec interpreter and mistress of Cortes, betrayed her own people in exchange for a new life. It is said that La Malinche bore a son by Cortes for the first mestizo of Aztec and Spanish blood, whom she later sacrificed when Cortes threatened to take the boy to Spain. Some say that the spirit of La Malinche is La Llorona. And so it's divided into five parts. One, the high priest of the pyramids feared La Malinche's power of language, mm-hmm. how she could form strange syllables in her mouth and speak to the gods mm-hmm. without offering the red fruit of her heart. He had visions of a white man who would change her ways with an obsidian knife. Mm-hmm. Two, La Malinche hated the way Cortes rubbed his cactus beard over her face and belly, the way his tongue pressed against her teeth. She was used to smooth brown lovers who dipped beneath her, who crouched on the ground and (laughs) rocked her in the musky space between their chests and thighs. Three, when the child was born, his eyes opened Aztec black, His skin shone café con leche. Mm -hmm. His mother wet his fine curls with her saliva to make them straight. His father cursed the native seed in that first mixed sun. Mm -hmm. Four, they slept under the black silk of a tenocha sky. The hammock molded around the two bodies, a woman's buttocks heavy after childbirth, an infant waited by the shadows in his skull. Mm. A coyote lurking near the river could smell their blood. Mm. Five. The woman shrieking along the littered bank of the Rio Grande is not sorry. She Mm. is looking for revenge. Mm -hmm. Centuries she has been blamed for the murder of her child, the loss of her people, as if Tenochtitlan would not have fallen without her sin. History does not sing of the conquistador who prayed to a white god as he pulled two ripe hearts out of the land. Wow, that's stunning. Thank you. Thank you. That will end. Thank you. This was great. It was fun.